Well, happy Sunday. It's nice to have everybody here. Whew. Do I want to just gloss over that? I was talking to Jeremiah outside and uh, talking about how great it is when things come together. You know, they choose songs. I gave him a general idea. Jeremiah gave a welcome with a scripture that we didn't talk about. And everything works together for the same thing. Do you know how that works? Because God's spirit works in us to accommodate what he wants for his people. And I think that's pretty cool. Uh, Talking to somebody else, a friend, uh, and they're actually here, so I won't name who they are, but we're checking in. Hey, how you doing? What's going on? And uh, they're speaking about how um, it comes in waves and that she was ready for some flat water. And I said, amen. Amen. Me too. And I started thinking about how uh, when you look at a shepherd and how the shepherd and the sheep go through life together, the shepherd experiences everything the sheep are experiencing. Right. The cold weather, the elements, the wolves, the the difficulty, the long hours out in the path, all the things. The shepherd is with the flock feeling what the flock is feeling. And I think that that is important because it gives the shepherd the ability to know what the sheep need in order to move together to higher ground, lower ground, better pasture, that sort of thing. I want flat water also. There's these moments in life when um, you reach the brink of yourself, right? Right? This is not code. I'm just telling you the truth about how I feel about life right now and about what the scripture says today. So don't, I'm just telling you, it's the only way I know how to do it. There are times where you feel like you're ready to tap out. My older brother, when I was growing up, would beat me up a lot. I say beat me up. He wouldn't like, you know, pound me or anything. He would just pin me down and sit on my chest and make me say, uncle, Right. We don't say uncle anymore. We live in a mixed martial arts world where everybody's tapping out. And there's these moments in my life where I feel like with God specific, I'm like, God, I have finally had enough. Like I can't take any more. I appreciate the test. I appreciate the growing and the ability and opportunity to mature. But uncle. And I feel like as a society and a culture and as a church, This is where we are collectively. And if you're not, I don't want to put that on you. Praise the Lord. I want you to enjoy the wonderful space that you're in. But if you're in a place where you are finding yourself saying, God, I want flat water. I need I need you to relent. Would you please, please, I'm tapping out. Then you're in a good place. You're in a you're welcome here. I'm glad you're here. Because you're not alone, you know. And a lot of times there's a couple of things that I try to understand in these seasons. The first thing is always, what have I done wrong? Right? God, what have I done that has caused this to be a thing? Lord, am I resisting you? Am I, am I living the way I want instead of the way you want? Right? Is there sin in the camp? And then I start looking at you. No, I'm just kidding. Not, not you, the collectively Bayou City friends that are sitting in front of me. But I look at we. I look at the we. I look at all the, the stuff around. Like, what are we as a people doing? As believers. I can't. The world is going to be the world. Right? Amen? We can't do anything about that. Why would they be living the way God wants them? They're not, they're not in the faith. That's okay. We can love them anyway. Right? We can love them anyway. Six of us can love them anyway. But the body of Christ, the believers, is their sin in the camp. What's happening that is causing us to be pinned down and in God's armbar to keep that illustration? And are we willing to are we willing to tap out or are we will we persist in going our way? Instead of humbling ourselves before the mighty God. Again, if you're living right, be blessed. 
If there is no sin in our camp, praise God. I'm not asking for it. I'm just trying to get us to understand like there's these moments where we find ourselves tapping. Because this is where Nehemiah was and the people of Israel. They had been in exile. They were actually living in slavery in their own land. Right? For context's sake, right, they had been taken over, taken into exile, and they had now been brought back into Jerusalem, but they were still living in slavery, having to pay ne- you know, crazy taxes, and they were being, they had no freedom. And last week we talked how they opened the Word of God. Do you remember this? They opened the Word of God, and the Word of God revealed to them some areas that they needed to make adjustments that they had forgotten, and they went immediately and did what the Word said. And that caused a deep conviction in their life. And that's where we find ourselves today. And I don't just want to talk about how we need to tap out. I don't think anybody needs to wrestle with the idea. There's moments where we need to confess and repent and all those things. But how we tap out is important. Because I think what we'll find is there are times where we don't actually want to be specific with our confession because then we can't keep running that direction, you know? When we're general with our confession, we can still hide in our sin. And the scripture is going to show us today that's not how he wants us to do it. There was sin in the camp of the Israelites. They had forgotten God's way. They were living according to the way they wanted to live. And it got them in trouble. They were disciplined. That's essentially what this is. They were being disciplined by God and now they were coming back to a place where they said, okay, God, uncle, let's look at how they do it. Before we get there, I want you to be reminded of something that uh, comes from the last chapter that we read. It's in in Hebrews chapter 4. Because the Word of God has this really interesting thing uh, that we need to be aware of. It says this. It says, for the Word of God, not just Hebrews, because Hebrews, when it was being written, was not thinking of itself, right? The writer of Hebrews wasn't thinking. This was talking about the Word of God, the law of Moses, the first five books, prophets, Psalms. All those things were part of the Word of God at that time. The Word of God is living and active, sharper than any double-edged sword. It penetrates even to dividing soul and spirit, joints and marrow. It judges the thoughts and attitudes of the heart. Do you ever think about that? Yeah. Nobody wants to read this scripture very much. It judges the attitudes, the thoughts and attitudes of the heart. It says, it goes on, it says, Nothing in all creation is hidden from God's sight. Everything is uncovered and laid bare before the eyes of him to whom we must give an account. It means that even if we think that God doesn't know, he knows. Even if we are good at hiding it from other people, it's not hidden from God. And the word isn't meant to bring shame and guilt and fear. It's meant to bring freedom. It divides joints and marrow. It divides our heart to bring us to freedom because God doesn't want us to live in slavery. He doesn't want us to live in slavery to our sin, right? Which causes brokenness. It causes um, detriment to us and others. And so I think as we're reading the scriptures, my hope is that you won't hear me at all. My hope is that God will speak directly to you from his word, because that's what we're getting into, his word. Right? And that it will cause all of us to tap out in some respect to the power and goodness and grace of God. Because his word is living and active. It's not just a history book. Because that would be boring. Here's what it says. Let's go back. So day after day, they read from the book of the law, right? They found in the law they were supposed to be celebrating. So they went and did the celebration. And then they did the celebration for as long as they were supposed to. And then they took a day off. And on the 24th day, it says this, chapter 9, verse 1. On the 24th day of the same month, the Israelites gathered together, fasting and wearing sackcloth and having dust on their heads. Now, the first part of tapping out with God is humility. This is what the Israelites, this was a posture of humility, right? Fasting. This was not a dietary need. This was not so they could get a better body. This was fasting. This was an an opportunity to take away all distractions and focus solely on what God wanted to tell them so they could live their lives differently in intimate communion with him. That was what they were fasting for. The sackcloth, right, basically burlap, they weren't coming in their Sunday best to this gathering. 
This was not about showing off to your fellow parishioners. This was about stripping away everything that could be a distraction, offering themselves in the lowest state necessary with dust on their heads. You see this throughout the Old Testament as people interact in humility with God. So that's why they did those things. Those of Israelite descent had separated themselves from all foreigners. This was, uh, foreigners were with the Israelites and that was welcome, that was good. In this moment as a nation, right, because the people did not have the same history as the Israelites and they were coming to confess specific sin to the Israelites and so they were doing that as a nation. This was not about separating from people that were not like them. They stood in their places and confessed their sins and the wickedness of their fathers. They stood where they were and read from the book of the law of the Lord their God for a quarter of the day. We just read a whole psalm and it felt long, didn't it? Some of you are like, man, is this going to be the whole thing? A quarter of the day they spent hearing the word of God, right, the law of Moses, And then another quarter in confession and in worshiping the Lord their God. <laughs> Just to get a picture. Quarter of the day, they heard the word of the Lord being read. You shall not. <laughs> Make sure that you don't. I mean, this is the law of Moses. History, law, a quarter of the day, they're hearing the word of the Lord. And then another quarter. I don't know what your confession time looks like. My assumption is, my assumption is, now I could be assuming wrong, so again, I'm not putting this on you. If you can confess for a quarter of the day, good on you. I hate confessing my sin because it reveals my deep lack of perfection and my inability to do it right all the time. So my confession, I try to get through pretty quick. Maybe you're the same, I don't know. But a quarter of the day in confession, some of you are like, well, I don't even have that much stuff to confess. Well, you and I sit down for a little while. We could work up a list. I don't know about you. My list, if I start thinking just from yesterday, I could spend a significant time probably. And it was specific. So they heard the word of the Lord. They were cut to the core again, and they spent time confessing. But the, this is the second part. Listen, it's not just about revealing your shame and your guilt and all the different things, right? There was this third thing that they did. They worshiped the Lord their God because it's not just about presenting yourself humbly before the Lord and making sure that it's spoken. It's remembering who he is and what that means and how that affects us moving forward, okay? So let's, talk, let's go to what it says. Standing on the stairs were the Levites. Look, you already know how I feel about this. You can read the names. There's a bunch of great guys. There's one guy, his name is Buni, and it looks like Bunny. So if you read it that way, I don't think God will get mad, but it's in there. So the Levites said, stand up and praise the Lord your God who is from everlasting to everlasting. We stood up and we have sung these wonderful songs together. Do you want to know how they started this? This is, this is the beginning of the tap out. This is how they did it. And I want to, hopefully it can prescribe to us a better way. It says, blessed be your glorious name and may it be exalted above all blessing and praise. You alone are the Lord. And then they start this history lesson. They confess out loud who God is and what he has already done to get them where they are. This is what it says. I'm, we're going to race through this because we spend all the time just reading it and I want to get to the main things. It says this, you alone are the Lord. You made the heavens and the earth. They start at the very beginning, right? You've made the earth and all that is in him. You are the Lord God who chose Abram. You found his heart to be faithful. You made a covenant with him. You have kept your promise because you are righteous. Verse nine, you saw the suffering of our fathers in Egypt. You heard their cry. You sent miraculous signs and wonders. You knew how arrogantly the Egyptians treated them. You made a name for yourself, so on and so forth. God, you divided the sea. You brought us into the desert. You came down, verse, 15, uh, verse 13 rather, you came down to Mount Sinai. You spoke to them from heaven. You uh, gave them regulations. You made known to them your holy Sabbath. On and on in their hungry, you gave them bread. You gave them water. You, 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 God, 
are the beginning of all things. And it's because of you that we're still here. You are the main thing of our history. You, God, have given us everything that we have and need in this world. That's the beginning of the tap out. You, God. Not you owe me. I don't deserve this. Right? What did that look like? God, you gave me breath in life. Right? You chose my family. God, you walked through the desert of divorce with me. God, you gave me a wonderful stepmother. God, you got me through junior high. Amen. You got me through high school. Amen. You have provided food. You have provided shelter. You have provided friends. You have provided tough stuff. You have gotten me through the difficulty. You, 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 you. And then he says this, the next part, but they. They enter into this acknowledgement, not just about who God is, but they, our forefathers, the people who have gone before, the Israelites who saw all of these things. And he says this, but they, our forefathers, became arrogant and stiff-necked and did not obey your commands. They refused to listen and failed to remember the miracles you performed among them. They became stiff-necked and in their rebellion appointed a leader, Saul, in order to return to their slavery. You, 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 but they specifically list their history. Look, I don't spend a lot of time listing out my history. Where are you from? Pick the country of origin, your forefathers, my forefathers, people who go before me because they are sinful people just as I am. We could list all of the things confessing that part of our history, just as the Israelites did. And that's what they did. Our forefathers blew it. They were stiff-necked. Now listen, before you get too riled up about it, if I was praying through this, you gave me, you gave me, you brought me, but I have become arrogant and stiff-necked and did not obey your commands. I have refused to listen and failed to remember the miracles that you performed among me. I have become stiff-necked and in my rebellion, right? Perspective matters. And then they switch again, but you, listen to this. You, 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 but they, now but you. You again, God, in the middle of all this stiff-necked rebellion, you are a forgiving God, gracious and compassionate, slow to anger, abounding in love and faithfulness. Listen, could you imagine how many voices would be saying this? But you, God, are gracious and compassionate. You're a forgiving God. Think about the, the ocean of voices calling out to God in this moment after they've remembered how terrible their history is. To stand there together and confess out loud, but you are gracious and compassionate, slow to anger and abounding in love. That seven other times in the scripture, that, that phrase is spoken. One was in Psalm 86 that you heard this morning. Another's in Psalm 103 and 145, Exodus 34, Numbers 14, Joel 2, and Jonah 4. If you want to know those, ask me later. I don't have time to do that right now. Seven times that it's in there. Therefore, because you are gracious and forgiving and compassionate, slow to anger and abounding in love, you did not desert them. Listen, you did not desert them. Aren't you glad that God hasn't deserted us in our sin? Aren't you glad that God in his goodness and grace and compassion hasn't deserted us as a people? Right? He's had every reason and right to have smited us, to smote us, smite, smote. What is that? Smoted, sm smit, no, not smitten. That's a different, totally different word. <laughs> but because, therefore, because in our tapping, God, you are goodness and gracious. And he goes on, right? Because of your great compassion. And they list a whole bunch of other stuff God did. Again, history. This is their spiritual summary of their walk with the Lord. There's a whole bunch more. You, 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 you. 
And at the end, verse uh, 25 says, they ate to the full and were well nourished and they reveled in your great goodness. And wouldn't that be lovely if that was the end of the story? You, 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 God, they did terrible things. They were rebellious and stiff necked. And you were gracious and compassionate and you did not desert them and you provided all their needs. And they ate to the full, were well nourished and they reveled in your good uh, in your goodness, your great goodness. Wouldn't it be great to live there? Wouldn't you like that? If we as a people were really good at reveling in his great goodness. Lord, you are so good. I remember I'm not going that way. I'm going to call it out because I don't want to live there anymore. I don't want to live in slavery in my own land. But they. Verse 26. But they were disobedient and rebelled against you. It says they put your law behind their backs. They killed your prophets and had admonished them in order to turn them back to you. They committed awful blasphemies. So you handed them over to their enemies who oppressed them. Listen, they're confessing out loud the specific things that they did that caused them to be oppressed and disciplined by the God they were praising. So in our confession, think about it. God, I am or have committed adultery. And because of that, you have handed me over and my life is falling apart. That's pretty specific. Right? That's what's going on there. God, I'm, I gossip about everybody. And it's causing my life and relationships to fall apart. Because I have done these things, this is what's happening in my life. Now, I'm not trying to tell you that I know right now people are like, well, just because my life's hard doesn't mean I'm sinning. No, that's absolutely true. Life isn't always hard because there's sin in your life. But this is a whole people talking about a whole nation and community that affects one another. It means this, that my sin doesn't just affect Johnny Marks. My sin affects the whole community of people. Just like your sin affects the whole community of people. This is not a group of individuals coming to praise God, check the box, let's go and live our life. This is a group of people connected and united in the love and blood of Jesus Christ, meant to be one in spirit and purpose. You get the picture? So that when one person hurts, we all hurt. When one person fails, we all feel it. This is what's happening. This is a community confessing sin together. Acknowledging that their sin has caused the brokenness that's happening around them. But as soon as they were arrested, verse 28, because you had great compassion again, you abandoned them to hand them over to their enemies. You again, you heard them from heaven. You had compassion. You delivered them from time to time. You warned them not to return. Stubbornly, they turned their backs on you, became stiff necked and refused to listen. Verse 30, for many years, you were patient with them. For many years, you were patient for them, with them, confessing the goodness and patience of God in the midst of their rebellion by your spirit, you admonished them through your prophets, yet they paid no attention. So you handed them over to the neighboring peoples. Thir verse 31, listen. But in your great mercy. But in your great mercy. Mercy being that attribute of God that doesn't give us what we deserve. It means if I sin against Kenny, he doesn't punch me in the face. There's this idea that I deserve something that is not handed to me. The mercy of God is that we earn and deserve hell and he doesn't give that to us. The great mercy of God. But in your great mercy, you did not put an end to them or abandon them for you are a gracious and merciful God. And that ends the history of their confession. And then they begin with the now part of their prayer. This is what it says. Now, therefore, O our God, the great, mighty, and awesome God who keeps his covenant of love. Do not let this hardship seem trifling in your eyes. Verse 33, it all happened uh, in all that has happened to us. Listen, in all that has happened to us, you have been just, you have acted faithfully while we did wrong. This is the essence of true confession, isn't it? In humility, 
acknowledging the greatness and goodness of God, his faithfulness through the ages, through the years in our own life, while accepting responsibility for the things that we have done wrong. Accepting responsibility for the things that we have done wrong. Again, acknowledging we are stiff-necked and rebellious, right? And at the end of the day, saying these things, God, in all that has happened to me, God, in all that has happened to me, you have been just, you have been faithful while I have done wrong. I've done wrong. God is not at fault for me doing the wrong things. I am. You are not wrong for the things I've done wrong. You're not at fault. I'm at fault. And I'm not at fault for the things you've done wrong. You are. Your kids are not at fault for the things that you have done wrong. You are. I am. And that's the essence, the very specific ownership of our mess so that we can lay it. Now, if it stopped there, we would all walk in shame and guilt and frustration for the rest of our lives and be awful. But it says in his mercy and in his great love. You know what the scripture says about that? It says that God so loved the world that he sent his one and only son, Jesus Christ, right? To take the punishment for our sins, which is death, to fix the separation, which is what is caused by our sin between he and I, to give us a hope and a future in life because he raised him from the dead to prove that there is no death in Jesus. And so when we come to tap out with the Lord, we find the same thing they did, mercy and grace, faithfulness and justice. And then they can celebrate. See, when you come to the Lord, you have to know that there is forgiveness and grace and mercy. Right? Just blind confession with no outcome. <laughs> Who would want to confess where there's no forgiveness? And yet we so often stay in that state of rebellion and slavery because we're not always sure that that forgiveness is for us. Here's what it says in Hebrews chapter 12. We love Hebrews 11, Hall of Faith. Anybody? We're like, yeah. Chapter 12 is great as it starts off. Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles and let us run the perseverance. We love it. We put that all over. In your struggle against sin, you have not yet resisted to the point of shedding your blood and you have forgotten that word of encouragement that addresses you as sons. He says, my son, you can insert daughter there. Do not make light of the Lord's discipline and don't lose heart when he rebukes you because the Lord disciplines those he loves and he punishes everyone he accepts as a son. Endure hardship as discipline. God is treating you as sons. Listen, God loves you, right? Right? That love is not a license to sin. And that love doesn't mean you can do whatever you want. Think about it like this. How many of you loved your kids? Those with kids, how many love your kids? Okay, when they're little kids, it starts real early. Don't put your finger in the socket. It always starts real sweet, right? And they look back. See if you're looking. Hey, don't put your finger in the socket. It's, you're gonna, you can get hurt. There's, there's a next level of like admonishment. Hey, look back, persisting. Hey, don't, don't, put, don't put your finger in the socket. You know, you pull, pull them back this way, get them. Pro and then what happens? They persist to put their finger in their so socket and they get jolted and hopefully nothing worse. See, because, and then you, you discipline your children because, well, however you do that, you discipline them because you love them enough to not let them kill themselves. And God disciplines his people because he loves you too much to let you die in your sin. See, God doesn't want us to live in rebellion to him, not so he can control us like pawns in the world, but so that we can enjoy freedom. How many of you feel free in your sin? Nobody, because that's not how it works. Sin is not a place for freedom. Sin is a place of bondage and slavery. Sin is a place of shame and guilt. 
while the kingdom of God and the forgiveness of God offers freedom to live with peace and joy and patience and kindness and all the things we find in the scriptures. He goes on and he tells us these things. 1 Peter 3.18 says, For Christ died for sins once for all, the righteous for the unrighteous to bring you to God. Romans 5.8 says, But God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Right? He's forgiving, gracious and compassionate, faithful, long-suffering, Romans 10 tells us that if we confess with our mouth and believe in our heart that God raised Jesus from the dead, we'll be saved, right? We will enter into a new freedom. So what does it mean to tap out for the Lord? It means that when we come to the Lord, we come in true humility. We set aside real time to give to him, to acknowledge him for who he is and where he's gotten us by clearly and honestly acknowledging our own sins specifically And praising him that that is not the end of the story. That he allows us, Jesus, to walk in freedom. Right? And then repentance is this idea of not going that way, but turning and going the other direction. Which we can only do in his strength and his power with his help. Does that make sense? And if we do that as a people, could you imagine? If we were so specific with God... As Bayou City Fellowship, why not use this church as an example to the world? We don't need anybody else's example. Let's let's be the example. What if we as a people were willing to have that type of interaction with God? God, we praise you for what you've done. You've been faithful for nine years, but there's a few things, Lord, that maybe we've gotten off track with. God, we confess these things to you. Like, I, I'm not even being specific because, you know, you'd throw stuff at me and then we'd be like, get everybody get mad. We don't do it because we don't find the grace with one another that we find with God. And I wonder if that could change if we lived a more humble confession uh, that is met with grace and mercy. I'll tell you this last thing will be done. Thanks for giving me a few extra minutes. I'm sorry for going a little long. Jesus Christ is the Savior of the world. In him we have true freedom. And it's so important that when you understand while God is calling us to himself, we will always be tempted to not go there because we're afraid that we won't find the grace that we need. You may not find grace with one another, but you will always find the grace, faithfulness, forgiveness, and love that you're looking for at the throne of God through Jesus Christ. It is always there It is always there. It will never go away. And it will always bring you the freedom that you're looking for. If you're looking for that freedom because you're tired of walking in sin, if you're a believer and you are walking in sin, I want you to know this, that you're a prayer, that you're like a moment away from finding that free place again. Because that sin is locking you up and it's keeping you and the greater body of Christ from moving in that freedom together because we are bound in Christ together. Let's let this be a week of tapping. I'll I'll do it in my life. And if you will confess this specifically and allow God to bring you into freedom, maybe we'll see some amazing things happen. There's a story of 12-year-old girls in India some years ago. They had this scripture come, talking about the fire of heaven falling on them. And so they prayed for this fire of heaven to fall on them, and they were lit up. They came to Christ, and then they started going around trying to figure out who they could pray for. What they did was they went to this nearby town, and they asked this missionary who was there, hey, can we have a hall or a barn? Somewhere? We just want to pray for your work. And he was like, eh, I mean, you should be in school, but okay, I guess everybody likes prayer. He let them go off, and they started praying. And he sat down for dinner. And about that time, a pastor in town came in tears, confessing his sin because he had been living outside of the way God wanted him to. And as he was talking, one after another after another came in the conviction of God's spirit to lay down those burdens. And they saw a great revival break out in that town. I wonder what Cyprus would look like if we as a people did this. We're so convicted by God's word and his spirit that we didn't let the devil keep us down. 
living in shame and guilt and fear. And rather, we lived in a heart of confession and repentance and cared for one another the way God has cared for us. I wonder. Father, I do ask that you would do a work in us and that you start with me. I ask in Jesus' name that you forgive me, Father, for arrogance or pride, that you would forgive me, Father, for speaking harshly, that you forgive me, God, for failing so often. And that you forgive this church, God, for ever stepping out of bounds. That you forgive us, Father, for being selfish and prideful as a church. Forever thinking that we are the only thing going. That we, God, somehow are better than anybody else. Father, forgive us as a people, as your believers, for not loving each other better. For fighting about stupid stuff. For not offering kindness and grace and mercy. And forgive us, oh God, for not loving the world better. Because you, God, are faithful and just. You are never wrong. We've been wrong. Father, help us not fear vulnerability or true confession because we're worried about feeling weak or looking as though we don't have it all together. We are weak and we don't have it all together. Most high God, be elevated in this place for the glory of your good name.